for the Arts Festival Summit 2022 in Yerevan, Armenia. Hosted by the Yerevan Perspective International Music Festival. More info on IFA's website. I'd also like to give a warm thank you um, to the IFA team uh, for the great support and for the really good cooperation that we had throughout all these years. So um, the collaboration will go on uh, this year and uh, during the next years on mainly two topics, digitization on the one hand and sustainability on the other hand. And it's not a surprise to you that uh, sustainability is one of our core priorities. Um, and we are very much looking forward to the presentations and the discussion today. They should give a good insight into excellent and inspiring projects, but also explore a bit how we can work on a professional level um, as festivals, as cultural organizations on the topic of sustainability in the current political context, of course. Um, we will have a few uh, representatives from a city, from a, a federal agency uh, with us, and maybe we can give some answers uh, on questions such as um, how to make a substantial contribution to climate change goals, and how can we best shift the festivals and uh, or other cultural um, events towards climate neutrality. And that we all know is a huge challenge. So on this, I wish you in Yerevan um, and all those who join us online a very rich discussion. And I give the floor back to Katrin, yep. the moderator. I don't know exactly. Peter is on du duty in one minute. I will, okay. I will give the floor to him now. And thank you, Anita. Uh, thank you, Silke. And greetings to Anita as well. We have received a wonderful letter from you. For our 70th anniversary, the network sometimes can be very friendly with each other. And Pearl is one of those networks. We have very friendly relationships also for this very specific capacity and work that Pearl is doing on behalf of the performing arts sector when it comes to legal issues such as uh, VAT, copyrights and so forth. Really, Pearl is the one in Brussels on behalf of Europe's performing arts sector that brings the voice and needs uh, towards policymakers. And we are very grateful uh, Members of Pearl, thank you very much, Silke. I hand over to Peter, who is Master of Ceremony tonight, uh, day. Thank you. Tonight. It's not going to be that long, I promise. Okay, we have three presentations, which are eight minutes long, and there's this incredible new software that actually causes a small explosion in the microphone if you go over eight minutes. So we can shut you down. We then have a round table where there are also specific instances given from different perspectives. The very simplest reason we're here is that sustainability has meant survival for many arts organizations over the last few years. But as we move on, it is entirely about how we drive to net zero as an industry. So what we're going to be exploring are not only how individual festivals can do that, but more importantly, how festivals collaborating can do that and within those collaborations, what the role of EFA might be, both in terms of disseminating information, but also in terms of campaigning and um, facilitating collaborations, and collaboration being the buzzword for everything we do in this conference. So, our first speaker is Tamar Bruchemann, who is the director and, importantly, founder of Wonderfeel. The reason I say importantly founder is that Wonderfeel, a festival in the Netherlands, a classical music festival that takes place in a nature reserve, has been conceived and developed and driven on entirely sustainable, ecologically sustainable grounds from its inception. The lessons that she's learned have informed uh, a project that she and I have been running together, which is a European festival's forest, and she's going to talk about that for the first eight minutes of this session. Tamar. Well, thank you, Peter. And um, <laughs> thank you also for doing this together with me, because he's also one of the founders and 
uh, initiator of the European Festivals Forest. And some of you might have already heard of the forest. Some of you already joined the European Festivals Forest. Um, but for those who don't know, um, the European Festivals Forest is a very, very simple and effective and joint climate action. Um, and I, uh, you can do the next slide, please, yes. In our sector's aim for net zero in 2030, this carbon sequestration project, which is the European Festivals Forest, complements your best practice in refusing, reusing, recycling sustainability policy by offering your carbon emission, uh, by, off by offsetting your carbon emissions by planting trees, of course. It's that simple. Um, next slide, please. And how do we do this? Well, you can either um, choose for a carbon levy on each full booking. And we talked to the festivals now joining, and most of them uh, optioned for the second option, like a voluntary donation, either on the checkout or also in the booking system. Um, but we can discuss this, of course, if you want to join. And it's very simple because one tree is just one euro, uh, two euro. One tree is just two euro. And where do we do this? We do this in Iceland, in uh, 1,100 hectares um, nature reserve in th uh, that is called Vattenshorn, which, as you can see, is quite next to um, Reykjavik. Who will plant the trees? Uh, we work with Skogretin it's, and its director, Thruster Eistansson, who is able to give his best value forest development for its maintenance and carbon sequestration. Um, having planting trees in Iceland for over 70 years. Well, uh, not Thruster himself, of course, but the Icelandic Forestry Service. Um, and Skogratin, the Icelandic Forestry Service, will measure and map the uh, European Festivals Forest every year with certified carbon sequestration reporting. And we will listen uh, three minutes to a short video with uh, Thruster and Peter walking over the Wonderfield site and talking Sorry about the Icelandic to. Forestry Service. What is the, what is the Forestry Service's mission? Our mission is to uh, from, from, the, from the outset, our mission has been to protect the remnants of the natural birchwoods and to grow more forests where appropriate. And, and what is appropriate is, has changed a little bit with time. And now, uh, with an increased urgency to sequester carbon specifically, then we need larger growing, faster growing trees than the Icelandic birch to really get the job done. Which is, which is why we plant those uh, for carbon sequestration specifically. And what do you know now about carbon sequestration rates in comparison with, say, peat bogs that, yeah. that forests can deliver? Uh, forest, uh, a vigorously growing young forest can, can deliver in Iceland from about uh, two to four tons CO2 per hectare per year to about 15 to 20, depending on the species. So the native birch is at the low end of it, the poplars are at the high end of it. So, so young, vigorously growing forests can, can get that. Um, also depends on the site, you know, some are fertile, some are not. Peat bogs in Iceland are always below one ton CO2 per hectare per year. Right. In other words, the sequestration is, is much slower in peat bogs. There's just less vegetation to take the, take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, much of the CO2 that's taken out of the atmosphere by forests ends up in the soil also. There's a big soil buildup. Right. So Sorry, <laughs> I just stopped. Um, is this be fixed in very soon, or shall I just continue? Oh, okay. Okay, I'll just continue. Then we can go to the next. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, I can imagine. So that part Yay. is permanent. Even though the trees get old and die, uh, the part that ends up in the soil is actually more or less permanent 
uh, sequestration like it is in peat bogs, uh, if they remain undisturbed. And by minimizing disturbance in the forest and by regenerating in a way that we maintain a young, vigorously growing part of the forest all the time, we can maintain over larger areas the, the, a good sequestration rate in the forest. So, so the main point is not to let it get old, not to let it senesce and then start releasing carbon, but to regenerate. We're not going to be able to stop emitting CO2 totally. So sequestration will be the part that kind of finishes the job. And um, all of the Western European countries have set a date, 2040, 2050, something like that, to, to uh, reach that. Just to thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, oh, and we get the film again. Yes. Well, the festivals so far joined in 2022 are uh, Festival Literatura, which just um, finished uh, last week, the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival in the UK, Remusica, uh, by Donica. She's somewhere here. Thank you very much, Donica. Um, in Kosovo, Schiermonnik Oog Festival. Uh, you can all <laughs> try to pronounce that. Schiermonnik Oog. In the Netherlands, Stroom in Belgium, run by um, Sophie, who was here, is already back to Belgium. Walden, um, the Clara Festival by Joost, who's not here yet. But, um, and, and, well, Wonderfield, of course. And next year, Jovanka joins with Artlink Festival. Next slide, please. Yeah, when will we um, plant the first trees? They will be planted uh, in spring next year. But mind you, this is a long-term long project which will run for centuries, I think, I hope. Well, please join us. And um, by combining with other festivals across Europe, we improve economies of scale. So please come up to Peter or me and join us in the festival's forest. Thank you, Tamar. Can I add three very small things to this? Two bits of information, uh, one of which I truly love, and um, a, a request. The two bits of information are, the reason we're doing this is because within 10 years, a climate action plan will be as essential to any public funding as an equal opportunities policy or a health and safety policy. We have to get towards this, so the sooner we start doing it, the better for all of us. The second piece of information I want to share with you is the reason Iceland is the best place in the world to do this is because A, they've been already been doing it for 70 years and they've got a fully professional network to manage it. But secondly, the reason Iceland is such a great place to grow trees is because they don't have any squirrels. And squirrels and Arctic hares, which are the problem in Greenland, are death to your seedling. You just don't get that problem. So the adoption rate and the success rate for each of the seedlings planted is phenomenally high. The question I'd love to ask you is, if you have the will to reach towards net zero, and you simply don't have the resources and the manpower and the knowledge and all the facilities we need to do that, whatever scale of festival you're working on, we can help, and this is a really quick and simple and cheap way to do it, because it doesn't cost the festivals anything. The cost of your carbon footprint is passed on to your audience. That's it. So, we now move. Um, we'll take, Tamara and I can take questions in the in the round table later, because we need to catch up on time. Um, we're going to move to Romano Ugolini, who is the co-founder of Ambiente e Salute and Eco Events. He's worked for 30 years in industry. He's worked um, with woodworking machines. He's also crucially been sales director of the German company Survey Marketing and Consulting. And they have organized, and he has organized, over 70 trade fairs over the last few years. And all that knowledge has um, come into this extraordinary uh, presentation which he's going to give about eco-event certification. Romano, welcome. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Hang on one second. We can't hear you. 
Yeah, I keep speaking, test. You're in, you're in, thank yeah, you. I'm in, okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, good afternoon to our friends in Armenia and those that are connected in streaming here in Europe. I would like to thank SIFA and Italia Festival that have invited me to give this contribution regarding the certification of green events. Our company uh, is operating in Italy in the fields of uh, sustainability consulting specifically in the world of events. As the slide says, we spread sustainability in the world of events. Uh, we, we can move to the next uh, slides. Uh, we convert projects and ideas into sustainable actions uh, through a code, a protocol. Um, and then uh, after this uh, consulting phase, we certify them with Lega Ambiente, which is a uh, the largest and oldest environmental association in Italy with 120,000 volunteers and, and associates. Uh, we uh, have a mission and that is to help uh, festival and events in general to begin a road towards uh, sustainability is a journey. Uh, our vision is to bring uh, a common benefit to our planet through actions designed to fight climate change uh, many of these actions, uh, if you can go back, are uh, basically in, in these books uh, that, uh, of course, contains a lot of uh, uh, these tips how to make this, uh, of course, uh, sustainable. Our venue is a 100% uh, uh, electrical building. No fossil, no fossil fuel is used, so we have... Uh, almost uh, no carbon emissions. It's coherent, of course, with our mission and vision. We can move to the next one. Uh, the partnership, I think, is very important because uh, uh, Lega Ambiente are the sentinel of the environment in Italy. They safeguard the environment. Uh, they have done over 40 years campaign, uh, educations uh, in schools, uh, research, uh, legal reforms. They have a committee with 150 experts from scientists to academic to researchers uh, to legal. Uh, and they serve, of course, in uh, the Ministry of uh, Sustainability in Italy. Um, partners are among Lega Ambiente. I mentioned Italia Festival who uh, invited us. And then um, the business schools of 24 uh, hour uh, business school. SIMA is uh, the Italian Association of uh, medical um, uh, medicine that studies pathologies deriving from, from pollution. So quite, a, an important, uh, um, quite an important partner. Um, I don't see any more of the slides. I hope you do. Um, we lost the, the slides or, yeah. Anyway, okay, yeah. Uh, we have generated also a master with a 24-hour uh, business school. Uh, it's an executive master in green event management. Uh, it is made of uh, basically 60 hours of uh, um, school and uh, 30 hours of project work. Uh, uh, what is eco-events and why uh, the certification? Um, basically, um, it's made of, we can go to the next uh, uh, slide. It, uh, what it is, is a, is a protocol that includes uh, topics like waste management, logistics and mobility, food and beverage, energy, communication, acoustic, ethical and social responsibility and governance. Um, the philosophy is based on uh, what we call the four R's. So the first is reduce, reuse, recycle, and repeat, because obviously it's an endless process, the one that uh, we are proposing. It is addressed to um, event uh, managers or event organizers um, for small, large events, sports events, festival, cultural, uh, and uh, exhibition. And basically, uh, the, the, the three basic dimensions are not only environment, but also the social and the governance. Um, how is it achieved? Well, we do a pre-audit verification. We do training, which is basically consulting and teaching of all the best practices. 
there's a, a management of, uh, of uh, manual. Uh, there's a compilation of uh, 115 um, uh, best practices. And then uh, at that point, uh, there is the issuance of the certification. Uh, it's on a trust basis because, of course, uh, when we go in the field and do the verification of the compliance with the parameters, um, it, it may be withdrawn. Uh, therefore, um, we have uh, this assessment, which is done through a checklist. Uh, there are different weight uh, according to how important they are. Uh, useful as a value one, and then relevant, important, fundamental, and the mandatory value four. Uh, in order to uh, get the certificate, uh, you need uh, to obtain at least 60% of the score uh, and the value. It's a little complicated, but of course, in eight minutes, we cannot cover everything. I will leave this presentation. This is basically the path through, through the certification, the pre-audit, uh, the feasibility study, we do the whole management and planning of uh, uh, the event. Then we have a, a checklist at 115 points, and then there's a final audit. And then, of course, the certification is uh, uh, given. Uh, some examples, uh, we can go very, uh, very quick, quickly through this. This is Umbria Jazz. It's a 50 years old uh, jazz festival in Perugia, Umbria, Italy. Next slides, uh, other views. These are, of course, uh, open air festivals. An example of a certification at the Rossini Opera Festival in Pesaro, uh, indoor. Um, next, uh, this is the wonderful uh, festival Pucciniano. Uh, Puccini is, uh, of course, from Luca and Viareggio, and this is an open air uh, venue, and uh, we accompany them through the certification as well. Another example is uh, Opera Estate in Bassano del Grappa, but it takes place uh, generally in uh, the Veneto region. Um, okay, um, there are many, many more. Uh, the one in the middle is the uh, electric Fiat, uh, which uh, uh, Fiat Chrysler asked us in Turin uh, to uh, certify their uh, launch of the electric Fiat and then uh, of course, we have uh, regattas, we have uh, sports events, bicycles, etc. A few seconds on this last slide, which uh, basically I'll leave it. Um, on the top left, uh, we see people that basically want uh, uh, a better environment, uh, what uh, needs to um, of course, uh, be uh, done is uh, make a commitment and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, select uh, what we're going to do, set targets and goals, and then, uh, of course, develop uh, a climate action plan and adaption strategy. Implementation, very important, because if we only do theory, we don't achieve much, so we have to implement uh, and then, of course, we have to monitor and report. Validate means certified. So what we do is um, a third party certification. Uh, that is to avoid greenwashing, because as you know, a lot of people can make statement, yes, I am green. Yes, I'm doing something for the environment. But one thing is to say it. And one thing is to have somebody that goes there and really verify. This is particularly important in, uh, in Italy. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the end phase is uh, uh, report the, the actions that uh, have, uh, have been done and then uh, maybe modify uh, for the next uh, uh, year, uh, as we said, is itinerary. Of course, all experiences are different and uh, so the path of, of, of reference uh, has to be adapted to the location, to the situation. Romano, this is, this is brilliant. Can I just interrupt you for a second, because we're running on slightly. There, there are two questions that, that I have, actually, and there's somebody else in the hall. Would anybody else like to ask a question to Romano now? You, you, uh, okay, you've got Short here coming. With a, okay. Hi, my name is Short. I'm just wondering how your initiative compares to, for instance, uh, a Greener Festival or Julia's Bicycle in the UK. Can I, can I nuance that question? Actually, I'm not going to nuance it. That's a nuanced question. I'm going to make it brutally simple. How much does it cost? 
Um, it cost, uh, it starts at 700 euros and it can go up to 5,000 euro, depending how uh, the uh, time involvement in the teaching and uh, consulting that we have to do, because as you can imagine, is related to time. Uh, the less time uh, we uh, get involved, the less expensive it is. Great, thank you. We're all up suffering from severe location envy, I have to say, to all your Italian festivals. Sorry, Romano, um, I, I didn't get, is, does, it, does this include a CO2 analysis? No, the CO2 analysis is, uh, uh, is separate because, again, uh, I give you an example. We have uh, now a exhibition that is uh, the, one of the largest nautical exhibition in Genoa. And uh, this exhibition uh, is uh, uh, basically nine days and they have uh, 120,000 visitors. So to do a CO2 analysis of something that complex, as you can imagine, it requires a lot of data collection and uh, analysis, uh, which is done over weeks of time. So it cannot be obviously included in a 700 euro uh, No, of, of course. So, Listen, that's yeah. wonderful. Romani, you're staying with us to join in with the um, round table. We're going to move on to our next speaker, um, who, is Natalia Oskar Jakab, who uh, is one of the great, most dynamic of the Hungarian arts producers and is most closely associated with the, um, the Valley of Arts, which really significantly deals with rural-based festivals and is now moving to Brussels with an incredibly exciting new job. Natalia, all yours. Still this one. And, uh, so, hi, everyone. I could see my slide for a moment. Okay, and there it is. So, okay, so I'm representing uh, the movie Setek Ovidiek Fejlesztésé, so Arts for Rural Development. And, uh, oh, okay, <laughs> so the Arts of Rur uh, for Rural De Development Foundation. It, I mean, it, the name says it all. Well, we had this crazy idea like around eight years ago that what if we wouldn't just organize festivals, but, yep, and, yeah, yeah, <laughs> hmm? Yeah, I was pushing this one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you just could uh, go to the next slide, it would be great. So, uh, eight years ago, we had this crazy idea because then at that time we already were organizing the Valley of Arts, a great uh, festival which is 10 days long and situated in a village or three villages in the Balaton uplands. During the 10 days, we have 200,000 people visiting. Thank you. And uh, uh, all those people. <laughs> Uh, you know, were invited with so much marketing effort put in, and then we were leaving all those channels for a while, just hanging there before we had the new names for the next festival. So we had in mind that uh, let's put out a foundation with the mission of uh, to develop rural areas in, with using arts and art events for that. So in order to boost regional recovery, sustainable local tourism, and contribute to infrastructural development of uh, these uh, rural areas. <coughs> So we are trying to maintain and promote local values and intellectual traditions, provide active and meaningful re recreation for visitors, inducing development of local infrastructure, showcasing high quality genres in a rural setting, raise awareness to diversity and inclusiveness, and connect these areas to a startup ecosystem and to most and foremost promote sustainability and do it in a sustainable way. So the festivals we are organizing are the Valley of Arts and actually uh, there are two smaller ones. The Keragdon Festival is starting on Friday actually in a completely different ar area, Irving Eshe Picnic. And we have some partner festivals where we could promote all those uh, things without being the main organizers. Basically the main idea now shifted to a more complex thing 
than just using the older social media during the uh, whole year, promoting all the providers that are there and natural wonders that are there anyways in, uh, after the festivals as well. So if you just to give you an idea where our festivals and partner festivals are situated, so we are kind of covering a lot of corners of Hungary. And the Valley of Art, so as I told you, and not to take up too much time, we had 200,000 visitors. Uh, we have a massive range of genres from contemporary dance, uh, classical music, and pop rock music, and theater, and literature, and loads of uh, stuff. So next year, we are going to be presented from the 21st till the 30th of July. So please be welcome. It's uh, you know, you know European capital of culture as well. And what I had in mind already in 2018 to work around the sustainability. You know, it's the you know really basic ecological, social, economical uh, call three pillars that we were trying to look at really in a holistic way. We tried it out the Valley of Art at the Valley of Arts, and then actually helped all the other festivals to use these methods. And uh, although we don't have a label yet, it struck to my mind that perhaps the validation part could be interesting in order to give a greater PR to that. But what, uh, what, uh, these are the things what we did so far. So the economic pillar, and I would start from that one, because Hungary is not the richest country, so therefore cultural subsidies are not the bigger ones as well. And well, being sustainable means you have to invest. You have to think long term. And as we were here in the round table and heard that uh, there, for some festivals, it would be a, a bigger comfort to have a budget, you know, long had for a few years, it's the same problem with Hungary. You receive your budget or any subsidies actually before one week before your festival, and this is the situation when you have to really have the courage to think ahead. So we started using recups, biodegradable cups, plates and utensils, and uh, we started building up all the infrastructure around that. Because in 2018, I thought that I would just choose a provider, and there is is a kind of net working around that. But it turned out that there were no washing points at that point, and especially it was not allowed to do biodegrading in the industrial way as it needs to be done. And if you just dump a biodegradable cup on a landfill, it would stay there for 25, 30 years as well. So you haven't solved the problem, I'm sorry. So when all those providers came with all these mater uh, material to me, trying to sell their goods, I was saying, OK, but let's build up the whole net. That's how, uh, how I contacted the Pannon University. Uh, they have a circle economy department. And we started conducting researches on what comes out from this biodegrading dead things, which meets wine, which meets certain kind of foods, because that's how you can foster legislation to be promoted in order to allow the whole activity. And then, if, you, if it's legal, then there would be some uh, providers that would be brave enough to start this activity. So uh, since 2018, we are the only ones in Hungary who have the special permit to buy the great stuff in order to do conduct all those researches with Pannon University. And of course, there were the 86 partners, the service providers, which we had to convince one by one that let's meet halfway, and we know that you would use some of your profit it when you when you are just uh, using these more and more expensive things but please help us and uh, don't push all the plus uh, additional costs to the visitors and of course we had massive campaigns uh, uh, towards our visitors as well we have free festival buses free parking lots outside the festival and what what really made the difference this year that this year it uh, if you showed the festival ticket at any point in the country you could uh, go 50 percent uh, discountedly by every bus and train so basically, even from Debrecen, the really far corner. And actually, people really used it, and it really made a difference. Uh, from year to year, we invested in building up the power grid. Now, all 
on my sites, all the 42 stages are uh, supplied by uh, or from the power grid. So uh, from year to year, during the 10 years I'm there, uh, we became completely aggregator free, which, which again uh, helps a lot. And uh, we focus on education as well. We provide a massive green programming in order not to just, you know, make visitors understand why we are do doing all that expansive stuff and imposing on them things that perhaps they just wouldn't know and want to do because they would like to have fun only. Uh, and not only this, but we are kind of teaching them techniques, smaller steps you can take as a person, as a small person, just a small family unit at home, which can make a difference. And like this, you educate your visitors, and now they're not that shocked afterwards by your <laughs> all promoted things. And with the collaboration, again, with, uh, with the Pan University, we are conducting researches. And based on those researches now, last year, they uh, managed to de do a sustainable festivals know-how manual, but which we are rede redeveloping, redeveloping step by step together. And, okay, so ecological pillar. Uh, as I told you, we went recap and biodegradable, and you can see the numbers to actually each every year we had more and more visitors, especially like in 21 plus 15 percent, this year plus 20 percent compared to the previous year always. And you see the waste just went down. And not this number is the <coughs> really important one, but uh, if you see, uh, more and more percentage became recyclable. We have on site like 20, 25 people who would not only, uh, because of course we have recyclable, uh, so all the points for all the types of uh, waste separately, but you know, after midnight, no one would look for the plastic or, or the whatever kind of paper container. So we have actually people selecting the waste on site. So that's why we can uh, be better and better in this uh, percentage as well, because we are leaving less and less waste to be just dumped on the waste field and in total as well. So please see 2022, 200,000 visitors, 36 tons, and 65% was recycled out of that. So I think it's very good. And, and we have some further plans on that. And that's, these are the techniques and mechanisms that we are tr uh, teaching to the other festivals we are uh, in connection with. And again, the buses, the all the types uh, of, uh, you know, all the means how you can reach a festival, depending where it is from, and uh, those can again just make your carbon footprint uh, even smaller. Actually, we would like to do once, like actually next year, a carbon footprint uh, uh, assessment as well. I hope we can do that. And uh, for example, we are <clears throat> the really last uh, step, social sustainability. We are really in high contact with the villages in themselves and we de developed a cultural space for them, which is a slow, li slow living space. It's not the 10 days madness with the 2000 programs and the 20,000 people around but uh, a small space for co-working, developing sustainability together, how to live sustainably there, and uh, to have some small concerts and some community building, which we can provide by this festival. So thank you. That's absolutely fantastic. Congratulations. And also, your 2021 and 2022 audience numbers are just extraordinary and congratulations on beating COVID so heroically. But please stay just for a second because I think, I, has anybody got questions on what they've just seen? Please roast me. <laughs> because um, it's so encouraging and so impressive that I think there are lots of models. Yeah, you do. Is it meant as, a, as an example how, how you do this or is it actually something you can share another way with us? Are you pitching it as a model or? 
uh, actually, uh, we are we have this motto, and we are providing it for other festivals as well. So, for example, we do a lot of consulting to other festivals. So we try to assess what they have, where they are at in the process, and actually, it's free of charge. So uh, we do this. Uh, I haven't pointed out, but for example, we already did this for a Romanian festival as well. So we are just reaching out to. To further steps, and yes, uh, just to inspire, because I think still I know that uh, um, uh, loads of us started this journey, but I know of some who would say that it's so expensive and so complex that uh, a small step wouldn't count. And this this I came up for just to encourage to do the small st steps, and then you will come uh, to the three pillars and all the theory to it, even with the small ones. It's brilliant. Um, we've got to move on. Thank you for that. It's just fantastic. Uh, we're going to move into the second part of this um, session in a minute, uh, which is a, a roundtable conversation. But before we do, we're going back to uh, we're going back to perform Europe, and we're going to Silke because I think we've got a question from the internet for Silke. Yeah, could have you got a mic that you can? Use Audrey. Hello, <clears throat> hello. Can you hear me? Because we have an echo here online. I'm not so sure about the sound quality. Yeah, we can hear you. We're just. I think we're waiting for the question from. Okay. Um, I have a question to the. Well, thank you first of all to uh, all the panel and the speakers. Um, it's just very interesting to hear about all the different initiatives. Um, and uh, well, we have to dig in afterwards a bit further to um, explore uh, all these really good initiatives. Um, and for now, I have a question on the first presentation um, given by Tamar. Um, so uh, Peter mentioned at the end that the cost of the carbon footprint um, is with this um, forest, with this festival forest, shifted to the audiences. And I wanted to know whether Tamar can specify how you communicate this uh, to the audi audiences um, and whether that is an option for them. Is, the, is it optional or is it any way that a certain amount of the ticket goes to the uh, festival forest? And how much is on the shoulder? of the festival, so whether you know a bit the percentage, what goes to the audience and what goes to the festival. That was my question. I hope that was clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, as, as mentioned, there were two options um, to join the festivals for us, or actually there might be more, but we have to discuss this. Uh, but so far, um, for instance, uh, Walden Festival of Clara, uh, Clara Festival by Joost, he chose to do a so-called carbon tax or carbon levy or a levy on each booking of two euro. So he asked every visitor to, well, he didn't ask, he, he just <laughs> put two euro on every booking. So all his visitors pay two euro. Uh, with Wonderfield, my own festival, we asked for a donation and... Um, well, coincidentally, uh, one third of uh, our uh, wonderful visitors they they, uh, they made a donation of uh, for, for the first festivals forest uh, um, almost fourteen hundred trees in total. And and the answer to your question about whether the um, audience knows this is yes, 70, roughly seventy five percent of almost every festival's carbon footprint comes from its travelling audience, and. Uh, the audience, you can either add on ticket prices and pay it yourself, or you can ask the audience to recognize. And a really key part of this is going back to who the audiences are. Audiences for arts festivals are, by and large, activists. They're also early adopters. We found, looking around uh, at festivals in a survey we did last year of 35 AFA members, that the idea of sustainability was important both to the organizations but also to their audiences. And I think people, if they do embrace the idea that there is a carbon cost to going to a festival, will welcome the opportunity to contribute to it. Right, we're now moving on to Joris Janssens. 
who is joining us with a video. He is um, an academic who works in cultural and regional development in um, Flanders and in the European scene. And he's prepared with uh, Silke a, a short presentation, which we're going to watch on video before we start the roundtable. In the frame of this interview, we would focus um, a bit on, on the environmental aspect. Um, so, when, when we are speaking now about cultural organizations, and specifically maybe, maybe as you have audiences, if our audience are festivals, um, <coughs> which aspects are there to be taken into account when we're thinking about how to become environmentally more sustainable? Yeah, indeed. So, we had a, a holistic approach, that's how we call it, taking into account the various aspects, but a number of experts, aspects specifically uh, about environmental sustainability were touched on, and then more, more specifically in the research, in the mapping phase of the project, we untangled a bit, okay, what are the elements, what seems important when we think about uh, international touring and international presentation. And the first cluster of issues really have to do with reducing carbon emission, uh, reducing your, your footprint, footprint which, which is, of course, uh, an important and, and huge top, and uh, several uh, aspects are related there. Uh, you can think of, uh, of course, the mobility, mobility of the productions, the touring of the productions, the mobility of the artists, of course, that's very important. It goes broader than that. It's also about uh, uh, maybe, maybe more from, from a programmer's point, point of view, uh, about prospecting and scouting, so also the international mobility of the or the programmers talk about, about greening the production, maybe downscaling work, light productions, but also reuse of materials. Uh, what we often see also now these days is that not only the productions go on tour, but uh, more the concepts and the concepts are reproduced in a lot of ways. But it's also about greening production. And uh, more from the presentation point of view, infrastructure, of course, is important. And, uh, Energy, energy efficiency of uh, the venues, venues mobility, mobility infrastructure, green events and use of energy and materials there, mobility, mobility of audience. So several uh, aspects really have to do with uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions, reducing the ecological footprints and an important topic uh, related to that as well. This is of course what uh, new opportunities we have with the uh, digital transformation, which was also accelerated with COVID. We already saw that uh, there were some new uh, opportunities and new ways of working that we explored during the last couple of years. Uh, for instance, uh, showcasing in a digital world, for instance, that is something that we uh, learned a lot about the last couple of years. So these, these are some things that have to do with uh, reducing carbon emissions. But uh, importantly, there's also another uh, cluster of questions or concerns, um, which are not about reducing a negative impact, but also more about a positive role that we, as a cultural sector, as an arts field, can play. And uh, we know that. Uh, as a world, as societies, we face big challenges uh, with regards to climate transitions. Uh, we will be imagining a new world together and also in that context of the climate transition and energy transition. The transition towards more just and uh, sustainable society, we can also play a positive role in uh, an exemplary function when we reduce our own emissions, but also use the cultural space to reflect on how we live together in this new world of the future, and that's also happening. This is a positive approach, uh, the role that we play as a cultural field in, in the world of in transition. It's also to, uh, to deal with that and talk about that maybe later in the panel, uh, and not only the, the carbon and emission impact. Mm -hmm. And now, um, maybe getting a bit uh, concrete, um, uh, what, what are or what, what will be in, in the near future, future the, the biggest challenges for festivals and other cultural organizations when they transform into more sustainable organizations? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, a major, major challenge, challenge is, of course, uh, if you want, want to reduce your impact, impact, of course, it costs, costs a lot of money. money. So <laughs> That uh, we see that all over the place, uh, funding is a real issue. We are in an energy crisis right now, so a lot of uh, the major challenge at this point is really also it's, uh, it's finding a balance between uh, economical aspects and also the ecological. So that's uh, an important point. 
but also, also second, second it's, it's, I think it's a, a bit more complicated than that in the sense that um, you can be engaged as an individual, you can of course try to do something as an organization, but the main point is also if we really want to make a difference and make a change, we cannot do it on your own. Uh, it's more complex than that, for instance, if you want to uh, Green, Green your practices as a festival, you are dependent on, for instance, the infrastructure or mobility around you. Also, as an artist, uh -huh. can, can you travel, travel by train or not? Is the infrastructure there? So that's already uh, complicated things. What's also complicated things uh, is uh, the fact that we are working together in an international environment, which is very competitive. You need to be visible in the com competitive arts and performing, performing arts markets. You need to make, make a difference. So in that sense, sense we see that, that a lot of uh, artists, social organizations are struggling with, with that. that. Uh, you, you can, can make the choice not to travel, travel not, not to do something, something because, because you want, want to reduce your impact. impact. You, you need to be visible, you need, you need to, to grasp opportunities. So it's, it's a constant balancing exercise. And uh, in, in the research from Europe, we see that uh, Depending on the regions where you work, um, the priority letter can change. We saw that uh, ecological sustainability is a bit higher on the priority letter uh, in uh, the same more privileged uh, regions. The regions where there is better policy support, the regions where there is more resources also for uh, artistic production and dissemination. We have uh, other regions which are more isolated, and there, of course, uh, first, first priority is to break out of the isolation, and there, there is a fear that uh, an increased concern with ecological sustainability will even increase the isolation more. So this is a huge challenge also working together in an international environment. So we need to tackle this issue together. It's not something that you can do on your own just by reducing carbon impacts. So, uh, Okay, okay, I, I think, think I think, think we'll keep, keep it there. We will stop, stop here at this point, even if of course we could continue um, probably another hour talking about um, about uh, the topic about also what you did uh, in, in the context of Perform Europe. Um, yeah, yeah but, but for now, this is food for thought. I think for the second panel for the panel discussion in Yerevan and. Um, we wish, wish you there a very, very fruitful discussion. discussion. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much Jokos Janssen, Janssen, for having joined, joined us. Bye bye. bye. You're welcome. Bye. bye. Have a good evening. Thank you, Joris. Thank you, Joris. Thank you Sutka. Right. Um, can I invite Tamar and Robert Piaskowski, who's going to talk? Um, to join us on the stage. And actually, Natalia, could you come and join us as well? Because I know that this wasn't planned, but what you said was brilliant and fascinating. So it would be great if you could join us. Robert's going to talk directly about his own experience in a second. But first, we're bringing in online Sebastian Brünger, who is a research associate at the German Federal Cultural Foundation. He's also a theater maker of some distinction and um, has been most recently running a pilot project for CO2 balancing in cultural institutions in the new program, Zero Climate Neutral Art and Cultural Politics. Um, Sebastian's going to talk for, I think, three or four minutes, and then we're going to have Robert talking for about the same amount of time, and then we're going to be taking questions as a panel. Sebastian, are you there? We can see you. You look fantastic. Well, that's great. Thank you. But you can't hear me? Yep, we can hear you as well. All right. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to join online here. It has been a very interesting contribution so far. So um, since I have the feeling I somewhat represent the cultural policy part here, uh, as well as Robert, I would like to point out that the German Federal Culture Foundation promotes art and culture within the scope of federal competence. And it mainly promotes, it funds uh, programs and art projects mainly on an international level with an annual budget of 35 million euros. So it's important to know um, the foundation is not part of the federal government, um, but yes, of course, we try to give impulses for cultural policy in Germany as well. Looking at the specific topic of ecological sustainability, um, we as a foundation, we have three 
perspectives that somewhat overlap to uh, what Joris just said, and which I'm going to lay out here briefly. The first is the artistic examination of the climate crisis. Art and culture can play a crucial role in creatively shaping the necessary transformation process and making the climate crisis comprehensible and tangible through art. That's what Joris just uh, described as his positive role. And as a foundation, we have funded many art projects in, over the last decade. And these kinds of applications that have the climate crisis as a topic, we see getting more and more over the last two years. The second perspective is production conditions. Um, in Germany, we are still, I have the impression at the beginning, especially compared to England, the Arts Council, Julie's Bicycle was already mentioned in the audience. So in Germany, we have the impression we still lack knowledge, numbers, tools, and uh, which Julie's Bicycle is calling carbon literacy. And as a result, the climate impact of art in Germany has long remained an unknown. And but luckily, more and more protagonists of this sector really want to study it now more in detail. And that's why in 2020, the foundation, we initiated a pilot project for carbon footprinting in the cultural sector in Germany. And um, Romano just touched it briefly as well. Carbon footprinting is an important tool for conducting a status analysis. How large is the carbon footprint of your organization, of your festival? And the aim in our pilot project was really to test this instrument for the sector. And in our project, 20 cultural institutions, theaters, museums, libraries, concert halls, got coaching and a carbon calculator to actually do this footprinting. And the feedback here in Germany, at least, was really enormous. It was great. And the media attention was huge. And the interest of politi politics was there as well. So. Um, I think if you're interested in this um, realm and this field of carbon footprinting, there is a uh, documentation of our project on our website, but we as a foundation are standing on the shoulders of giants. There's lots of good material and a carbon calculator on the website of Julie's Bicycle. And I'm convinced if you want to tackle these issues, these climate um, impact issues of your festival, this kind of status analysis is really essential as a starting point because it really helps you to identify the relevant factors and it's a good basis for decision making. Shall you, for instance, print the program or shall you not? Or shall you invite this great artistic company from, I don't know, from Brazil or shall you not? So it's really what do you decide for and what do you decide against? And a third, let me please add the third perspective. This is rather a political one. And it starts rather with our internal foundation practices, because we as a foundation also want to reduce our footprint. And we've been running an environmental management program for 10 years now with EMAS and doing carbon footprinting for two years. Our biggest footprint is also events and mobility. But of course, it's our funding activity, actually. So the biggest question, I think, is how can we support our, the project we fund to minimize their ecological impact. And over the last years, our answer was by incentives. We have been providing guidelines, we have been inserting an appeal clause in the funding contracts, and we have been asking environmental questions in the application forms. But to be honest, the effects of these measures was not really big. So that's why we are actually now considering how aspects of ecological sustainability can be set as a requirement for funding. So it's not incentives anymore, but it's actual obligations. And in the mentioned pilot projects, that was actually a test. Maybe carbon footprinting could be a criteria for awarding public money. And there's a starting political debate in Germany, and I think in other European countries as well, about this question of whether and how cultural funding should, implement, should be an implemented criteria um, within ecological sustainability. So the link between funding and ecological sustainability. Maybe that's for now. Sebastian, that's brilliant, thank you, and really, really clear, and both alarming and inspiring for anyone who's involved in maybe applying for money to you. Um, can I ask you, 
the sort of correlative, the obvious correlative question, which is what role does the foundation, your cultural foundation, play in educating the people to whom you might be giving money? And if you are in that position of requiring some kind of climate action plan and, and practice, how are you fostering that with all your financial clients? Well, thanks for this very good question, because um, I think as a funding body, when you talk about re making requirements, you have to give the protagonist the possibility to actually fulfill these requirements. So it's, as Joris also said, it's, on the one hand, it's a question of money, um, of course. Um, but secondly, it's a question of knowledge. And um, I think here again, Julie's Bicycle and the Arts Council do a great job they make requirements and they tell you if you want to have money from the Arts Council, you need to calculate your numbers. But at the same time, they give you the opportunity to do workshops and to actually acquire um, the knowledge to do this calculation. And I think this is a great example also for other policymakers to have this combination in mind. And to my understanding and what I see, um, there are lots of other funding institutions and sponsors for cultural institutions who actually are thinking about this link and it's about real new also criteria for success you all probably know that if you want to have public money there's also always a question of success and many most of the time it has been the criteria tickets sold and i think in the future we will see a lot more alternative figures and rather alternative reporting standards. Brilliant, thank you. And a perfect link to our next speaker, Robert Piaskowski, who is not only himself uh, a distinguished um, festival director, but more importantly acts here as the plenipotentiary for the mayor of Krakow, which is, as I'm sure you know, one of the great festival cities in the world. So he not only has, uh, he has experience from both sides of this fence, but crucially, is also part of that conversation about obligation, regulation, and empowerment. Robert. Hello again. Um, much points has been covered already by my brilliant uh, co-speakers, ladies and colleagues. Uh, this is the actually slogan of Krakow competing for green capital of Europe last year and being in the final. And we could not imagine that the role of, of festival could not be involved or engaged into the whole entire process. So that's why uh, the greenery and livability of Krakow is one of the most strategic um, pillars for the strategy of the development of the city. And as you see here, even our shape of the city is embedded by a um, belt of greenery. And also this belt, it's like our everyday bread, like a bagel from Krakow. So it's so connected every day. As you see, expenses from the budget of the city of Krakow are equal, almost 5% for culture and almost 5% for greenery. And it shows the balance and it shows that both policies are connected. We want to live here. This is a slogan of the city of Krakow in the, its strategy. So we don't want festivals like this. And it's impossible for a festival to ignore the fact that we can generate carbon footprint, we generate wastes, and so on. So Krakow festivals are more and more keen in establishing common values and standards. And you may know these pictures from last night, and it was like everything we believe, what makes great festivals and sustainable festivals. Togetherness, greenery, local food, hospitality, responsibility, no noise, and great program. Yes, so we prefer festivals like this, which are more like lifestyle, which are more like discovery of nature, our green parks, spaces which has not been used even before pandemic because pandemic actually helped us to discover open spaces and to treat them in more responsible way. And also to discover river, 
banks which has not been visited and river and water is important. Water is not a commercial product like any other, but rather a heritage with which must be protected, defend and treated as such. So we defend water in a very festive way, building boats, different sculptures and in engaging activists in protection of the biodiversity of our rivers as well. But the goal is simple, to double our forest forestation until 2040. So how to plant 7 million trees without festivals? That's the question. Recently, uh, we've opened Center for Education for Kids, Eco Education. We have also Mayor Plenipotentiary for, uh, for uh, Climate Eco Education. We have Climate Academy for students in Krakow every year, uh, connecting different partners. And just an example, for on the occasion of the mm, Nobel Prize uh, Award for Olga Tokarczuk, she is very known for her activism for animals, plants and all of the creatures. We've planted 25,000 trees and, and they created new forest actually close to the Krakow. Its name is Primeval and the Other Times, just to tribute her very first book. Of course, I don't want to speak about content because all of the festivals refer to some of the eco issues. That last Sunday we've concluded Bomba Megabitova Festival of the Future, where we have presented the results of the panel uh, of citizens, climatic panel uh, of citizens, uh, presenting almost 100 recommendations and Festival's community uh, members were present also present in this panel. Some of the projects here shows also that digital culture is a chance uh, to bring more ideas for the future, like messages to a post-human earth, a great project uh, designed in Botanical Garden in Krakow, and story just showing that some t b b maybe the knowledge about our humankind will be just uh, encoding into DNA of plants to preserve information for a future world without humans. Eco Continuum, this is a project of one of our festivals to bring the mm, link between technology and nature. But um, in 2019, Unsound Festival developed the very first recommendations for festivals and created the same model as you uh, presented here, Tamar and Natalia. We could really count how much cost the um, travel from Amsterdam, Barcelona, how many plants you can purchase and donate in the same moment you, you buy the tickets. And they were uh, almost 6,000 uh, trees planted after one edition of the festival only. So festivals for climate change, this is our very recent round table. Uh, we gathered 30 festivals all together. And we speak about recommendations we learned from other festivals, for example, from Edinburgh, which has just developed their strategy for sustainable festivals. So. Of course, it concludes, it, it concerns travel to and from Krakow. Uh, travel in Krakow by festival staff and artists. And some of the uh, recommendations very concrete, like electric vans for transporting or electric only taxi contracts, waste and recycling, um, buildings, uh, transport provision. Um, waste and water at venues no, owned by festivals, travel outside of Krakow by staff, artists, touring productions, and so on. Data also, email hosting, and so on. So those details, it's not maybe to discuss and to present in such a detailed way now, because we all work on this. But I think that important is that we work collectively all together, because the projects cannot be solve um, separately. And just an example, as we have very good quality of tap water in Krakow, actually, according to some of the survey, the third best one in Europe, 
I don't know if, when, when, whether it's true or not. But uh, water department is providing to all of the opener festivals and concerts water tanks and just to avoid plastic bottles. And this is just so easy. Shared spaces, such a trend. We give um, uh, green spaces for free in collaboration with uh, green departments. So all of the festivals which are held in parks or Vistula banks are for free. We um, help in, uh, and facilitate um, some of the collaboration between uh, institutions. They have gardens or own parks to collaborate closer with festivals uh, organizers like here. And we all like uh, symbols also. So sometimes we celebrate all together in some of the illumination or eco um, values um, like here. Uh, sharing spaces uh, all together. And a ban of fireworks in Krakow. Very controversial decision, but taken already in 2013. So, as you see, it shows, it looks like apocalyptic pictures now, but uh, <laughs> 10 years ago it was beautiful. We promoted our festivals through fireworks, and I still see in many uh, video promotional uh, campaigns of the festival's fireworks as a yeah, it's a heritage as well, but it impacts the, the environment in very serious ways. So this is a historical picture from 2016, and probably you won't have any newest. Um, yes, we go to the roots, uh, because that was the party before. Uh, flowers, reds, and, and just simple candles on the river, and just spending time all together because our climate clocks uh, so we decided to even remind this on the largest very unsustainable facility of our town arena that we need to solve the problem of the festivals collectively all together and this is an initiative of one of our green film festival uh, which is a free festival uh, showcasing and, and uh, screening all of the documentaries uh, concerning different climate issues. Thank you so much. So, you know, obviously, Robert, my, my prime question for you is, how difficult is it to move to Krakow? Our, our house price is affordable. I mean, ca how can I come? When can I come? Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, the the, the 4.7, 4.8 thing about culture and, and greenery. What's the overlap? And do you, is any of that 4.7 linked to environmental practice and, and the kind of regulation that Sebastian was talking about? We have, of course, some uh, major regulations uh, which has city established, for example, the novel uh, um, um, voted by the city council, no plastic program for Krakow, but it's very connected with the strategy 2030, and now we work on the update till 2040, 2050, just including uh, all of the mm, recommendations of uh, New Deal, Green Deal uh, of the European Union, and also having very ambitious um, mm, plans to reduce carbon footprint by 80% in the year 40, and then 100% by the year 2050. By 80% 80, by 80 from what? From now, from, from, from yes. 2022. Until 30, we should reduce uh, by 30 percent. So it's not maybe very ambitious, but we start this process in Krakow. Of course, um, all of the green investments uh, in Krakow are spectacular because it's the very first city in Poland uh, completely banning uh, solid fuels for heating their houses. Uh, so it's a huge achievement, and we could not achieve this without festivals and especially social movements, Krakow Alarm, Smoke Alarm. Now it's a popular movement in the entire Poland. And then all of the investments like water, like uh, greenery, 54 new parks, uh, over eight last year only, they change our landscape, but it 
they cannot be treated only as in, as investments. They they should be livable, and they should be co-managed. So the idea is to include uh, sustainable development goals to all of the cultural institutions' uh, mission, and we've been updating that that over the last three four years to include. Uh, Agenda 2030 into um, all of the charts and statutes. And now uh, we start the process all together with festivals, um, but we don't want to be disconnected from larger vision. So we don't want to really do statements as festivals only. We, we, it, it's a cultural sector response to the major vision which is a city vision. Otherwise, we will be disconnected, and that's, that's the mm, key point. Got it. Tamar, can I just ask, ask you something about practice at Wonderfield? Because one of the things that you've pioneered is quite a radical approach to food available to your, your festival goers. Well, you call it radical. I, I call it 10 years late. Um, I think uh, what we did at Wonderfield uh, was uh, we all our uh, food was meatless um, and most of it was vegan um, and or vegetarian. And um, I, I don't think it's very radical and I think it's needed to... It's, it's very easy and we, all, we talked about um, uh, money that it's... Uh, uh, a, a huge investment. Well, actually, if you uh, turn your festival into meatless, it will uh, give you extra money. Uh, it, it, it will be less. Uh, for instance, our uh, crew catering, uh, we have about, I think, uh, 1,200 meals per day for crew catering, uh, and it costs two euro less because it's meatless. So just do it. It's easy. <laughs> And, 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 it, and it also is incredibly popular with your audience. Well, I don't think uh, a lot of them even noticed, but we did, yes, we did a survey, so we asked, and um, they were perfectly fine with it. And, Natalia, can I ask you in, in a similar vein, what is, given that there is th this absolute need to reduce and reuse and recycle, and once we've sorted out our energy supply coming from uh, renewable sources and we've started to do our waste management. What are the two things that you're just, maybe just one thing that you have found is the most successful environmentally sustainable practice that you've put into, into account? Well, I, I think the whole education part of it because uh, it's one thing that I could do these practices at my festival. But I could hear back that those 86 suppliers, because our food catering is not in-house, we have 86 suppliers coming to our festival, then actually uh, we're okay when like few years later, the same measurements were promoted in different other festivals. And they, because of me, already knew about it and were more acceptable towards it because actually the uh, first time I wanted to do, for example, reusable cups and the, uh, the biodegradable uh, things, it was in 2016, I went up on the stage, I had not like a uh, nice crowd like this in front of me, but 80 kind of really mafioso looking guys. <laughs> and I, you know, I started naively saying that, yeah, I would like to do this and that. Ah, they almost killed me, so it's, uh, thanks God I'm still alive. Um, because it turned out that it's, uh, it's in the hands of some really shady people. Sorry, for, like there are, of course, great exceptions, but uh, this whole catering providing scene in Hungary is quite backwards. Well, I must admit it's easier for us because we ha we build our own infrastructure and we invite our own food trucks. We're not depending on, uh, like you, on on um, on the infrastructure that is already there. So I, I we just decided, um, but I'm 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 still. Well, I hope that it's still uh, possible to persuade. <laughs> Sorry, and anything that we just built up, for example, for years and years we were building up the internet uh, in the, the villages uh, and, you know, then 
comes the social aspect of the sustainability that we realize that these villages are shrinking and for example the basic service of a wide web <laughs> is not there so after a while we said okay give us less sponsor money and this year not build up the wireless points but start building up the optical cable and bring the IPTV and whatever. Very, I, I want to come to Romano um, in, a, just in a second, but Tamar, can I ask you a, the, the question that I think comes from Sebastian's point about the Brazilian orchestra? At what point in your programming does, I don't want to fly 96 people across the world inform your artistic choices and your taste and aesthetic? Well, this year we invited um, Trio de Cali coming from Mali. Um, and we asked them because they said they were, they were touring through Europe, so it would not be, they would not be flying to the Netherlands just for, for us. Um, and we agreed on this, uh, black and white. And in the end, um, they didn't have a tour and they just came for Wonderfeel, which felt really, really bad. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we will have a guest curator, uh, Evus Jarkaya from Istanbul Music Festival next year. Uh, and she will bring over, uh, of course, a lot of Turkish musicians to Wonderfeel. Um, and I'm not sure if I would do this in the near future again to invite a guest curator from such a far away country because of these uh, travel this travel impact um, and I'm really thinking in um, investing in ASF uh, uh, um, aviation uh, SAF as what, what is the uh, aviation sustainable fuel sustainable aviation fuel as um, so it's not that the Turkish musicians coming to Wonderfeel um, we'll use this SAF in their plane, but we will invest in it so that others will travel with SAF and, um, well, just to have a, a little stone in the pond in this. But I was, um, can I ask a question to everybody or maybe? Can you, can you hold the question for a second? Because I just want to go to Romano, uh, who I, uh, I can see is still here. Thank you very much. Your book, which is uh, sort of translated from Italian into the event that is good for the planet. Um, is there such a thing? Oh, hang on, we can't, we, we've lost your sound. Can you hear me? Yep, Check. you're good. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, Peter, of course, the title is uh, provocatory uh, to engage curiosity on, on the reader, of course. Uh, uh, as we have seen, events uh, in general are not good for the planet. We've seen many examples uh, simply because they have a high environmental impact and, uh, or, or a high carbon footprint, if you prefer. But as we have seen, there are ways to reduce this impact. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, more importantly, uh, we can leave a legacy uh, to the audience uh, not only in terms of uh, giving them the satisfaction of a nice event experience, but also to instill this culture of sustainability. And uh, in fact, I applaud this uh, uh, organization of workshop today because uh, EFA, I understand, celebrates 70 years uh, of existence. Um, and they spread, of course, culture and arts uh, all over Europe. And I think that uh, it's uh, a very good starting point uh, with the 70th anniversary to start talking about sustainability. Um, I hope I answer your question about the book. Sure. I mean, I, I should say this conversation is going to carry on. When we go to Girona in um, April, there will be more on sustainability and, and, and an otherly curated package. I, I want to open this to the floor as much as possible. But just before I do, can I ask sort of all of you, um, maybe perhaps directed more at Robert and Sebastian, but I, w I want to hear what the producers also say about this. To what degree is the festival audience important to you in reaching the wider public? 
And Robert, perhaps you'd like to take that first, and then Sebastian. I, th I think that we we have we count our total audiences of our, our of our festivals around two million people participants. We don't know how many uh, profit on the online content. Uh, probably more, much more. Um, we believe that festivals uh, have this um, social change uh, force uh, and actually they do already on their own different programs in very successful way. Eco values, this is the best bridge to renew also audiences because those eco values are very important for young generation. You, we saw Dominica yesterday, her engagement and how, how her, uh, uh, how can I say, credibility in this. We have in Krakow, for example, vegetarian um, festival. We are proud of having um, many vegetarian restaurants in Poland, the, the most dense network after Warsaw. And uh, my nephew asked me whether he could come with 14 his colleagues from the uh, high uh, ground school and sleep in my place because they come for this festival and they never came for the other festival. And I got pop festival, pop music festival, theater, film music and so on. So it was surprising to me uh, that they came for vegetarian festival, but it was important for them. So, as, uh, so there's a strong generational component. Yeah, so if we speak about uh, regen rejuvenating uh, to make younger our audiences, our festivals, we should not only treat uh, eco issues as a new trend and something like fancy um, topic for festivals because still greenwashing is an issue for many of the festivals. They just have green um, colors, green carpets uh, instead of red carpets, but it's not truly a sustainable festivals. So to address the, the, um, to the new audience's needs and what is the um, easiest way to make so? Uh, to have uh, in your program council or in your programming team uh, young people. They advise okay. something like Great. volunteers or even employed officers. They can advise and they can be your partners. Okay, thank you. Sebastian, the festival audience, how, how can they impact uh, wider in, within a community? Uh, thank you. I hope the sound is okay. Yeah, it's um, good. Yes, okay, great. I, uh, I think there are two answers to your, again, interesting and great question. Uh, one answer is easier. Um, if you ask for the impact of the audience, um, content-wise, I think, of course, it's a great opportunity and chance to enrich and enlighten your audience uh, and to counter and to tackle climate issues. So um, there is a great positive role that festivals can play and uh, audience play a big part of that. But there is a more complex answer, which is the climate impact of travel of the audience. And at least here in Germany, uh, discussions are sometimes really controversial because here again, a huge audience and a worldwide audience is, uh, um, in, a, in a former understanding, quite uh, important for the success of a festival. At the same time, the ecological impact of a great worldwide audience is kind of uh, really bad. So these are really two interests who are really contradictions. To solve that, that's really crucial and really complex. Okay, thank you. Tamar. Can I ask you to, to give the microphone to Short just to repeat what he said yesterday about the impact of uh, going to your festival, Welcome to the Village. Please, can you repeat it? Sure, uh, the Welcome to the Village Festival in Leeuwarden. Yeah, we did, we, and I think this was in 2016, we did, um, I was working there back then, not anymore, but we did a calculation um, where we took the data, uh, which is 
generally known about what people ever on average use when they stay at home on electricity what their footprint is when they stay at home and then we did a measurement because we are a festival in the fields we so we could measure everything so we knew exactly uh, how people came and also what they what their footprint was at the festival and the footprint at the festival on average was lower than when they would have stayed at home so <laughs> I don't always agree with the statement that festivals are bad for the environment or for the footprint. Also, everybody should stay at home and have their own festival in their garden. Um, Natalia. Yeah. Well, um, just uh, to add on the travels, uh, that's why why I had the whole idea of because uh, you know we started researching where my audience comes from, and I suddenly realized that this is the one of the or actually it's the oldest multi-genre festival, 31 years old festival of the country. Our outreach is uh, country, like the whole country. They they would come from even smaller con corners, and it took me one year because I need to get, got up to a ministerial level in order they would sign for this transportation 50% off. Uh, but uh, I would uh, advise if for those who have a greater outreach to go out there and take up all the steps. Can, can I just ask you, whose idea was the 50% off the, tr the public transport if you buy a festival ticket? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> and how hard was it to persuade the, to, the travel to companies <laughs> to, to do it? Um, well, uh, I just want so, of course, uh, they, they had some kind of discount connected to something, and then I had the idea, but, you know, I had to, of course, uh, produce a kind of a paper, sporting report, you know, just put in some uh, vague ideas of sustainability that I wouldn't actually convince that would convince my, my minister on that. <laughs> Well, but uh, it, it but then I got on board actually the train and bus company because I convinced them that it promotes them as well as a company and they, they were in order to, to they wanted to you know enlarge their income. Brilliant, brilliant, Catherine. I wanted um, to follow up what you said, short. Uh, with um, an experience I listened to and I was thinking about that many time from Creative Carbon Scotland, I think it's called this organization that is working a lot on sustainability and without uh, taking away all the needs and the potential and the responsibility that festivals and the arts and cultural sector at large play, one of the very important third pillars of their work is to underline what they, I think, call uh, proportional accountability. They an analyze how much carbon footprint and how much waste and how much and so forth the arts and cultural sector is producing in relation to other sectors, big sectors, and this proportion is minimum, minimum, minimum. So when we look at questions if Turkish artists or we look at questions of inclusion and accessibility of artists and audience and so forth and we balance that and weigh that with the question should we not bring this artist over because there is other artists here we should she underlined she said don't be so harsh on you it does maybe make a difference but maybe it does not make a difference because your awareness about it and the role we can play as festivals is important but that doesn't mean that every single step that one needs to take in order to be boof is the right one. So it's a very complex issue and we should bear in mind that maybe one big portion of responsibility is for us as an arts and cultural sector, yes, to be green, but also to put pressure as a collective on those that are really making a difference and have an impact on changing something um, in relation to climate impact. Sorry, may I add as well, just we, we have to be some kind of role models. And of course, I didn't want to be a sustainability manager because my festival has the lucky situation to have the sustainability manager as a director. I just wanted to have the service to be, 
to a better way of waste management, that they want to know all the process of the chemical background of it, which I got into. And the same as well when actually we are completely Hungarian programmed uh, for two years now, but perhaps we will again open up towards international ones. And when we did uh, at a larger scale some international acts, we ended up uh, organizing the tour for them ourselves. So uh, in a way we started taking up uh, roles that wouldn't be necessarily our thing to do. It's tremendously significant, isn't it, that these two festivals, uh, which are extraordinarily environmentally engaged, both have people right at the very top of the organization who are committed to the idea of sustainability. And if only there was some kind of organization where people who run festivals all over the world got together on a regular basis and yeah, shared. Anyway, I've got three questions from the floor. First one's from Yurian. Yeah, we, we, we talk all the time about saving the planet, but if we are honest, we are saving our own ass because the planet will survive. But my question is, um, the, the, the example from Krakow as a green city with amazing uh, concepts uh, and, 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 and a green policy is, is in a way in opposition towards uh, the, the national um, government's development, which maybe is majority elected by, by countryside, by rural areas. So I see actually a, contra a, a problem here politically in the landscape we are facing, that cities and urban, uh, we come back to Eric Korain, they might have a certain uh, responsibility and an awareness, but actually when you take it on a bigger scale, and that's maybe also when Katrin says, we have a, actually a political problem here. We are fighting and we can be role models but the issue is very deep in a society rooted, which is that between nationalisms and uh, urban awarenesses and, and many other of the schisms in society. Yeah, I agree completely with you, Rian, especially that I just w shown you bagel, but we have bagel also communities, rural communities around the Krakow, uh, 16 of them, and they still hit their fireplaces with everything. So, and because Krakow is in a valley, so it affects us. And, but, the problem, uh, but the challenge is that we started the program to uh, engage those communities and connect them also with our cultural sector. Uh, it started last year and it's very promising. And of course, we have metropolitan area development strategy, which reflects on um, um, Krakow influence and, and strategic pillars. But I agree, this is uh, what we can do in the cities which are ambitious and, and they have leadership which believes that this is uh, right direction and also very engaged civic society we have in Krakow, many NGO and they really are really like watchdog society. But in um, on the level of a state, it's more complicated. Okay, we've got ten minutes left, and I've got three questions from the audience. Uh, wait, I, I think you wanted to. Okay, uh, so I just, because I, I was intrigued by Tamara's story about a, a trio from Mali, um, I just want to throw out an idea. There's a lot of festivals in here uh, who all have a different identity, but uh, some of them do cover similar niches. And it, it would be nice if those festivals could get together to look at the programs of each other and look what they want to program and see if there might be an opportunity for more a tour than just coming over for one concert. Uh, yeah, that's brilliant. Do you, I think you all agree, yeah? And again, if only there were an organization where festivals, I mean, yeah, God, here we go. Thanks. Um, in my observation, in Leeuwarden from running festivals the last, I think, seven or eight years, um, we've seen, when we talk about sustainability, we could also uh, replace that word with resilience. Um, I've seen that when you truly want to make your festival sustainable, you're actually talking about making your festival and the surrounding community resilient, which means that you try to involve in your festival people and sectors that all deal with the same values and goals. So we've always tried, this is a lesson we've learned, always try to involve businesses, corporations, elderly people, young people, children, 
um, NGOs and specifically also politicians, where we opened up our festivals to experiment with sustainable uh, uh, solutions, um, to ask sectors to come up with solutions for our festival and to see if we can implement that together. And by doing so, create a place, a temporary temporary place, where mostly everybody loves to come because it's a fun place and discuss these topics as well. So we've seen that festivals can be hotspots for this discussion, not by making it urgent or a problem, but by making it a place of solutions and positivity. And I think that is the biggest thing we've learned from the last eight or nine years. Can, can I comment on this? Please. I, I was in Biodome in uh, Montreal last weekend. It's a great, great place um, which reused old Montreal Stadium f to protect nature and, and tropical, tropical uh, forests, rainforest. And uh, the director, she said, we discover we cannot warn a young generation or people about climate change because it we cannot uh, change practices and attitudes through fear. So we, we try to show them how beautiful is nature and how beautiful is to be in harmony with them. So completely positive way of, of presenting, um, alerting and, and urgent issues. And this is a challenge for festivals, how to uh, do it in positive way, just to do not paralyze people in their hopeless and how I can I say, what can I do for the planet, yes? I, no. yeah. We got it. George Emmanuel. Um, thank you. I wanted to come back uh, to this example of the festival having, for example, a curator from a place far away in inviting uh, artists from, from, from that place. So, of course, there is this point of view of the sustain sustainability um, with this issue with flying over the world. Um, but of course, I think as festival makers, we can also we have also the the, the point of view that we are um, we are not we are aware about climate, but we are not specialists of, of climate. We are specialists of uh, culture. And when, for example, you invite people from or artists from a remote part of the world, you also raise the awareness of your audience for these places and also rising the awareness for these places you also rise the awareness for uh, problems and you rise the um, the the frame of uh, perception of your uh, audience and i think this is also a um, uh, an important uh, aspect that uh, that uh, that has to be taken into uh, consideration and one thing is also of course to achieve that you have to um, um, you have to uh, set a focus on the content and the communication and uh, to avoid uh, presenting uh, art or culture that is consumed like fast food, but uh, maybe uh, where you also raise the awareness, um, uh, focusing on, on, on your content. That's also a, a way to be sustainable. That's a great point. Thank you very Jen much. Sebastian, you've got your your rather entertaining hand icon raised. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to pick this notion up and to stress this point. And I'm really happy to hear that you eventually, Tamara, you invited the group from Mali because um, our foundation, its mere existence is to foster cultural exchange, in particular international uh, cultural exchange. So this is really, uh, the, I think the biggest challenge and the biggest problem, and I see it for you festivals uh, as well. So um, there are lots of ideas how to um, basically, yeah, to, how to do um, to, to a better exchange, how to uh, with those networks, uh, how to uh, improvise uh, the touring. But I wanted to stress one point. I mean, uh, we, we talked about privileged positions within Europe, but uh, we as European protagonists are of course in a, a privileged position of the global north and we as cultural institutions and artists from the global north are part of the society of the western societies 
that are primarily responsible for the climate change and the climate crisis in the last decades. So what about those people in the global south and artists from the global south who are actually dependent also on the money and on the cultural structure in the global north? So um, for instance, this uh, artist company from Mali. So it's, I think it's really a, a huge question um, how can we take this into account as cultural protagonists of the global north and how can changes be made without reproducing hegemonic neocolonial structures so I think it's really about it's brilliant informed, informed Sebastian sessions. thank you that I think will be one of the session topics definitely for Girona um, we've come almost to the very end I just want one point from Natalia and then tomorrow I promised you you would get to ask your question of the audience just a, a point of hope, I, what I could see, because we were packed with teenagers this year out of those 200,000, Gen Z might be not the best, perhaps, to work with, but uh, festival-wise, they, uh, they are the crowd that would raise those questions about why did you fly that person here, uh, why there is no vegan option, so after a while, all the others would be forced to uh, maintain all those measurements that only now perhaps some so smaller, fewer crowd would do. Got it. Thank you. Tamar. Well, I was just wondering um, uh, about all of your festivals, uh, directors, who set a date for uh, be, uh, to organize the festival Zero Net, so carbon neutral? Who set a date? Has anyone set a date for Net Zero? Sure. What happened? The problem in our case, thank you for this question, and thank you for confronting me with that. We are a, we are a festival of festivals, so we don't direct uh, the entirety of our program. So this is a very don't lively... Don't hide. No, I don't, I'm not hiding, I'm explaining. This is a very lively discussion right now. So for the, for the project that we run, 25, or the next one after that, well, maybe just to uh, all the all our governments has set a date, so it will be 2040 or 2050 or almost all of our governments. So I, I you have to <laughs> set a date and can, act can, accordingly. Can I very do something. nakedly say if you want to find something to do, we have a European Festivals Forest which can help you get there by 2030. <laughs> I would also say very quietly to you that if you have flown a thousand miles or more to Yerevan, then if you would like an opportunity to offset that at the mere cost of a tree per thousand miles or thousand kilometers flown, we also have a donate page on the European Festival Forest website. Um, can I thank our amazing participants, both online and in the room? I would also like to thank Catherine for being here, but most of all, I would like to thank Audrey Brissac, who is the most absolutely comprehensively brilliant producer of events and has given me the most of the thing. Um, thank you very much. See you in Girona and I hope you get there by train. <laughs>